Thank you for tuning in to the Be Blessed broadcast. Let's go into the service already in progress. No one is exempt. I don't care. I love your apostle. I said no one. I love my own self. I said no one. I don't care about the bishops, the priests. I don't care about the president. I don't care about all the great popes. No one is exempt from becoming spiritually shipwrecked. The text declares here, Elder Dacia, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and 19, cling to your faith. 1 Timothy 1, 19. Cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some have deliberately violated their conscience. They know what they're doing is wrong. Yet they still do it. They know how they're living. Doesn't please God. Yet they deliberately continue in a way that does not keep them at peace with God. And as a result, their faith has become shipwrecked. Hymenaeus and Alexander are two examples. I threw them out and handed them over in verse 20 to Satan so they may learn not to blaspheme. And sometimes as spiritual leaders, we have to learn how to take our hands off of the Hymenaeuses and off the Alexanders. We have to learn how to not get in the way of the Holy Spirit from doing what it needs to do. He said, I handed them over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme God. And sometimes people are under the persuasion that because you are the pastor, you should be doing something about this. You should be doing something about that. Sometimes you just got to turn people over and let the Holy Spirit do what it has to do and take your hands off of God's business. Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He says a man that these people in Corinthians are doing things that are not even to be talked about. A man sleeping with his mother or his brother's wife. He went on, he talks about all of the sin in Corinthian, and he says such things ought to not even be discussed. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn him over for the over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh so that they may be spared in the day of judgment. Sometimes you gotta take your hands off of a situation and allow something to run its course so that the Holy Spirit can intervene and do what it needs to do. You ain't the Holy Ghost. Take your hands off of it. Let God do what he needs to do. Let the Holy Spirit minister on a situation before you start inserting yourself in it too much. Let's be clear, people of God, no one is exempt from spiritual shipwreck. Saul was the first king of Israel, Demetrius, yet he was shipwrecked in his faith by deliberately disobeying God. Samson was Israel's most famous judge, yet he was shipwrecked in his faith by deliberately fraternizing and marrying foreign women. Hophni and Phinehas were the sons of Eli the priest, working right in the house of God, yet they were shipwrecking their faith because they slept with the women of God in the house of God and violate the law of God in return of receiving offerings from God's people. Achan has survived 40 years in the wilderness and made it to the promised land, but he was shipwrecked in his faith because he deliberately stole the first fruits from God. I'm, I'm talking about being shipwrecked. Solomon was the wisest and the most wealthiest person to ever live, but even he was shipwrecked in his faith because he deliberately served other gods and led God's people into our... I, I, I come to tell you that everybody is susceptible to being shipwrecked. Even the best of the best, the creme de la creme, are susceptible to being shipwrecked in their faith. So when Paul warns us not to deliberately violate our conscience, that conscience is what the Holy Spirit is convicting to get you to stay in line with the will of God. He said, don't deliberately violate your conscience. That's why he writes in Romans chapter 8, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation. To those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that begins to convict us. That tell us you're going wrong, baby. Molly, you in trouble, girl. You may not want to do that. Don't you touch that. Don't you go in that direction. You may need to pull out from that deal. Don't you put your money on the table. Don't you shake hands with them. Don't you do business. Over. It is the Holy Spirit that will convict us. And keep us from deliberately violating our conscience. But you can ignore the Holy Spirit. Oh, 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 
If we choose to ignore the warnings, there will be spiritual repercussions and damages. You've got to check yourself before you wreck yourself. And so often, Jessica, we sit in the house of God thinking we are immune to shipwreck because we came to Bible study. You think you're immune to shipwreck because you sit on the mother's board. You think you're immune to shipwreck because you wear a white collar on the first Sundays. You think you're immune to shipwreck because you're on the usher's board. You think you're immune to shipwreck because you sing on the praise team. You think you're immune to shipwreck because you gave a tithe and an offering. You think you're immune to shipwreck because you're on the intercessory team. Somebody shout, no one is exempt from being spiritually shipwrecked. Saul lost his position as king because he wrecked himself. What are you doing to wreck yourself on the day? There is a way that seems right, but you can be wrecking yourself, beloved. The first king of Israel, God given him an opportunity. God told him, when you were small in your own eyes. I chose you from the tribe of Benjamin, of the least of the families. I chose you to lead my people. I gave you a chance when you didn't deserve one. But you got beside yourself and didn't check yourself, so you wrecked yourself. And God says, I no longer need you to be my king, and I'll raise up your replacement. Samson suffered blindness in his position as a judge because he wrecked himself, Cheryl. Hophni and Phinehas died on the battle on the same day and never became honorable peace in the house of God because they wrecked themselves. Achan and his family were stoned and never enjoyed the promised land. They are only just defeated Jericho. They crossed over the Jordan River. They went, they got the stones and they placed it and set it up as a memorial about what God had done and how he crossed them over the Jordan River just like he did the Red Sea. So they're now in the promised land and God is telling, he's telling Joshua, listen, the Jericho is yours. Go in and take the land. You don't have to fight. All you got to do is shout. Do what I'm telling you to do. Obey me. Keep my commandment and I got your back. You don't have to fight with the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Perizzites. The Gergesites, the Jeff, you know, all you got to do is march around this city one day for six days and on the seventh day march around seven times and shout. Do what I tell you to do because I've given you the city. I didn't say I may give you the city. I possibly, I have given you the city. And God says, when I give you the city, take the things from the temple and destroy them. And the holy things put in the temple. But don't try to rebuild Jericho because whoever tries to rebuild Jericho, they will do it at the expense of their firstborn. So don't try to resurrect this place because I'm destroying it. Jericho represents your enemies. It represents your greatest threat. God says, if I can get you past your greatest threat, then everything else will be easy. Have you ever been on a schoolyard? Have you ever been there and you got this real big bully? I used to go to elementary school at 107th Street Elementary in South Central Los Angeles. And I was a little bitty something. You may not believe that. I didn't start growing this tall until I got in high school. But I was a little bitty something in elementary. And there was this real big old girl. And I'm just going to call her. Uh, I don't want to call her name because she may be watching. What can I call her? I call her bully. Help me, Holy Ghost. And she was always trying to pick on me. Hallelujah. And I began to try to avoid her because she was so much bigger than me. I can imagine God says, if you can beat bully, then nobody else will bully you after this. God is trying to help you to understand that once you get past your Jericho, you can beat AI. You can beat the Gibeonites. You can beat the Canaanite. You can beat the Hivite because Jericho is your greatest enemy. But when you fight this battle because it is the first of many wars, I want the spoils of war. Don't you try to keep what belongs to me. And Achan got greedy. He decided that he wanted God's portion from Jericho. And because he didn't check himself, he wrecked himself and his family. Sometimes you not only wrecking yourself, but you can wreck your family too. You can wreck your family because your family will follow you. They'll follow you all into the depths of destruction. They'll follow you all the way to Lodabar. They'll follow you to dangerous places. So fathers and mothers, you got to be careful how you're leading your families. Leaders, you got to be careful how you're leading your parishes because your children are following right behind you. And Achan not only destroyed his life, but the lives of his children that came after him because he didn't check himself. 
Solomon was disposed as king of Israel and could have been a better king than his father David. But he didn't check himself. I came to challenge you on this morning to check yourself. Check your conduct. Check your actions. Check your attitude. Check your theology. Before you fall into spiritual shipwreck. 1 Corinthians 10 and 12 says, if you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. If you think you are standing strong, 1 Corinthians 10 and 12, be careful not to fall. We're not just standing because we think we, we off in a bad place. We stand when we stand in a way. We stand because we think we standing right. But Paul says to check your standings. And be careful that you don't fall. The temptations in your life, he says, are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure it. The King James Version said, there had no temptation overtaking you that is common to man. But God who is faithful will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. He will not suffer you to be destroyed above that which you are able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You don't have to be shipwrecked, beloved. The Bible says some have deliberately violated their conscience. That's what it said in 1 Timothy 1.19. Go to 1 Timothy 1.19. They have deliberately, do your Bibles read like that? Deliberately violated their conscience. You know you're doing contrary to God's will. And your conscience is even uneasy about it. Yet you still do it when God has provided you a way of escape and you didn't take it. He provides a way of escape and we don't take it. There's something that's coming against you and you know it makes your conscience uneasy. You know because the more you do something, the less conscious you become about it. You can keep doing something out of repetition and rote religion that after a while it doesn't have the same effect. So you do one thing and the Holy Spirit don't give you a peace about it and he's providing you a way of escape to go to the left and don't go to the right. And you know you can go to the left but you still choose to go to the right. You are deliberately violating your conscience. When God says, I need you to pray, get up out your bed, come and talk to me. I know it is my favorite time, 2.34 in the morning, hallelujah. The Holy Ghost is shaking you saying, get up. He's providing a way of escape. You already got cushion carpet with pads under it. But Gerald, we don't want to get off the bed. I'm providing a way of escape. I'm trying to come to you. What do you do? Turn over and go right back to sleep. You don't realize that prayer could have saved your child that afternoon. You don't realize what that prayer could have prevented if you'd have got up and honored God at that time of consecration. This is a sign that you are spiritually shipwrecking your faith when God provides a way of escape and you don't take it. You're shipwrecked in your faith when you insist on doing you over what you know what God would have you to do. You're going to do you over what you know what God would tell you to do. You're on the road to spiritual being, spiritually being shipwrecked. Because you're no longer sensitive to the Holy Spirit. God is shaking you. He's warning you so that the enemy don't come and overtake you through condemnation. But because you are spiritually shipwrecked, you ignore the way of escape and you go the way that you want to go. Let me inform your theology that after you've been shipwrecked for some time, it will eventually lead to reprobation. Some of you may have not even heard the term reprobate. To be reprobate is a continuous hardening of the heart to the way of God. Your heart is, are you quiet? And I'm glad you're listening. Your heart has become hard. 
God is trying to talk to you through the scriptures, through your leadership, through his still small voice, and yet you won't take heed. And the more he speaks to you, the harder your heart becomes. God can't reason with you. He can't speak to you. He can't deal with you because you've left being shipwrecked where you're no longer just taken and you're veering off the, off the path. You're to a point now where you have set up a wall between you and the Holy Ghost. It cannot come through it because you have basically gone to be a reprobate. Reprobation leads one to a state of spiritual and moral depravity. When you are a reprobate, you basically will do what you want to do, live how you want to live, and call it right, even though you know it's wrong. The Apostle Paul later tells his spiritual son in Timothy, he's in the same letter. We started in 1 Timothy chapter 1, but if you go a couple chapters over to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, he says, now the Spirit speaking expressively, that in the latter times... Some will depart from the faith. And Elder Denise, I, w- I was reading this and, 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 and I was really thinking about preaching from Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is the discourse that helps us to understand eschatology in the end of times. That one of the things of coming to the end of times is a falling away of the faith. People are leaving the house of God in droves. People are no longer rooted and grounded in the things of God. The things that the Holy Spirit used to can reason with them, they're no longer receiving that. They don't want to receive correction. They don't want to receive rebuke. They don't want to receive instruction in righteousness. They don't want to receive doctrine. And if they do receive doctrine, it has to line up with their doctrine. People are falling away from the faith, Sonia. People who were once rooted and grounded printe are no longer even practicing their faith anymore. So he writes here, the spirit speaks expressly. It speaks clearly, Paris, that in the last times, the last days, people are going to depart from the faith. They're going to go shipwrecked in their faith, Jessica, by giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They will speak lies and hypocrisy having their conscience, there that word go again, having their conscience what? Sear with a hot iron. King, the NLT says, go here. Give it to me in the NLT. Verse 2. These people are hypocrites and liars and their consciences are dead. Do you understand what dead means? The dead don't, they don't praise. They don't do anything. They go down. You don't receive anything. You can't be sensated. You can't be stimulated. These people's conscience are dead. When your conscience is dead and seared with a high iron, it means you're spiritually dead and insensitive to the working of the Holy Spirit. You get your skin burned. I've had my fingers burnt before. One of my fingers. And what happens is that the skin becomes cauterized and it becomes hardened. And I stopped receiving, Kyrie, the sensation in that. I felt it in the other ones. But the one that got burnt, Paris, it no longer mother had no sensation in it. I couldn't feel what the other four feet, y'all don't hear what I'm saying on today. I couldn't feel what the other four fingers were feeling because this one was cauterized with a hot iron. You can get your conscience seared with a hot iron that you are spiritually dead to the things of God and you no longer hear the warnings of God. And as I've already mentioned, Paul calls out two particular men who he specifically said were shipwrecked and they were Hymenaeus and Alexander. Somebody shout Hymenaeus and Alexander were shipwrecked in their faith. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us much about these men, but what we do know is that they were shipwrecking their faith, and they became a problem for Paul and for the early church. Turn with me to 2 Timothy. This is still Paul talking to his spiritual son, Timothy. And when you go to 2 Timothy, as I stated earlier, this was the last epistle that he had penned before he's off the scene. So he's in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15. 2 Timothy 2, 15. The word of the Lord declares, work hard so you can present yourself 
to God and receive his approval. Okay, some of your Bibles may say, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needed not be ashamed and to rightly divide the word of truth. He says, be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. He says in verse number 16, avoid, flee, run from worthless, foolish talk that only leads to more godless behavior. I say to you, any talk that does not build the believer and bring glory to God is foolish talk. If the talk doesn't edify, build up, construct, and bring God glory, it's foolish talk, people of God. The gossip off to the side about somebody else, that ain't none of your business anyway. Study to mind your own business and to work with your own hands. All that gossip is foolish talk. All that pulling to the side and inappropriate gesture is foolish talk. Getting on the phone talking about what ain't happening and what is happening is foolish talk. Anything that does not build the believer in the house of God is foolish talk. And Steph, Paul says to avoid it. Some of you not powerful and strong enough because if it's your sister girl, you will sit on the phone and indulge that old foolish talk just so she won't be upset with you. But you leading yourself into a situation of being spiritually shipwrecked because you allowing somebody to dump all this garbage down in your spirit instead of saying, hold up, sis. You know what? I see you troubled on the day. Y'all got enough holy bonus to do that? I see you troubled on the day. Let's go ahead and touch and agree. Father God, in the name of Jesus, whatever's perplexing my sister, God, I ask that you would cast it down in the name of Jesus. I bind this spirit, oh God, that's trying to destroy her. And God, I stand in faith with her for her peace in the name of Jesus. Amen. Sis, I pray you're feeling good on the day. Let's touch and agree on tomorrow. Oh, you're quiet in God's house. No, we get on the phone. Brr, brr, brr. Hello? What you doing, girl? Mm. I'm just sitting here. Did you see what they was doing on Tuesday? You know that that just what fool. Somebody shout foolish talk, foolish talk. That's foolish talk. Did you see what Samoya had on the other day? Somebody shout foolish talk. Fool Did you see what happened at MIT? Somebody shout foolish talk foolish do you know what they was doing at the food bank on Friday somebody shout foolish talk foolish talk and it only leads to shipwreck Paul said avoid it flee from it run from it but what do we do when people ain't calling us we calling them Sonia didn't answer let me call Mariah Mariah didn't answer let me see what Denise is doing Denise didn't, let me see what you, you looking for trouble and I always wonder why you upset, why you stressed out, why you overwhelmed, why you don't have no peace. The Bible said I'll keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on me, not stayed on no mess. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are virtue, if there any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You got to shift your thinking, beloved. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that which is good and the acceptable will of God. God never told us to indulge in no foolish talk. You looking for trouble and wonder why you weigh down, walking in God's house way down, walking in the prayer meeting way down, walking in the Bible study way down, looking like you have lost your best friend. Will you learn how to 1 Thessalonians 411 study to mind your own business? You'll have an experience the peace of God. Whatever's going on in the Watson house ain't none of your business. And if they decide to tell you, it ain't none of your business to share it with nobody else. Somebody shout, I'm not going to be shipwrecked. I'm just not going to be shipwrecked. I'm not going to be shipwrecked. I'm not, I'm not going to be shipwrecked. This gossiping spirit that has crept in the house of God is destroying innocent believers. And as Paul indicated in his first chapter of 1 Timothy, he said these vain babblings only increase the godliness ungodliness people are being left and departed from the faith because they're confused 
They're uncertain about the, the, the temperature in the house of God because we're listening to vain babblings and people are falling away from the faith. Any talk, he says in 2 Timothy 2 and 16, he said you need to avoid it. That leads to more godless behavior. If it doesn't build up somebody, if it doesn't bring God glory, it's foolish talk. He says in 2 Timothy 2.17, this kind of talk. What kind of talk, pastor? Foolish talk that leads to godless behaviors. Lead to godless behaviors. Foolish talk. This kind of talk spreads like cancer. As in the case of Hymenaeus and Philetus. When I looked at this verse here, it started with Hymenaeus and Alexander Leo in 1 Timothy 1. And now in 2 Timothy chapter 2, it looks like Hymenaeus done spread his cancer to Philetus. He, he didn't say nothing about no Philetus, Heidi, in chapter 1. He said Hymenaeus and Alexander. And you thinking that you're just talking to somebody innocently. Somebody is listening to you. Do you not realize the amount of influence that you have over somebody? And we got to give an account for our soul's salvation with fear and with trembling. Those people you are leading astray, those people you are leading on the road to destruction, you have to give an account to that. Hymenaeus has to give an account for Philetus. Started with him and it ends with him. Spreading his gossip like a cancer. God didn't call you to gossip. He called you to pray. Men ought to always pray and not faint. He said, come to the throne of grace that you may obtain favor to help you in the time of need. You have not a high priest who has not been touched with the feelings of your infirmity, but in all points tempted just as you are. God knows every pain. He knows every disappointment. He knows every trial. He knows every setback. He knows every, in, 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 every division, every device of every confusing spirit that comes against you. We don't have a high priest who has not and cannot identify with our infirmities, but come boldly to the throne of grace. God says, I want to help you with your limp. I want to help you while you left into the house of God. I want to help you so that you can leap again. I want to help you like the man that sat at the gate called beautiful. That when I give you silver and gold, I ain't got to give you. But such as I have, I give unto you. Take up your bed and rise up and walk. And the Bible declared that man stood up on his feet. And he started leaping, jumping and praising God. And went into the house of God and brought God glory. Simply because they gave him Jesus and not gossip. spreads like cancer you wonder why your children do the things they do they get it from you and if they're not following your examples be mindful of those who you allow your children to associate with you got to train up a child in the way that they should go you can't just leave your kid with anybody and don't think it's not going to affect them you got to guard your kids. You have to protect your kids' innocence. You got to guard your kids' ears. You got to guard your kids' their innocence. You got to protect them and stop leaving them with people you think look like a Hymenaeus and an Alexander. Hymenaeus and Alexander were in the house of God. That's why Paul said I had to put them out. They were in God's house. And because they're in God's house, you can leave your kids with a Hymenaeus and an Alexander. Because they look like they were in the house. Because they sat in the seats. Because they came to Bible study. Because they came to the usher meet. Because they were on the praise. You got to be careful who you leave. Because it's already bad enough that they got to deal with the stuff around them. Ask Eli. His two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were called the sons of Belial. How can a righteous man have hell hellish sons? How can a man that leads as the priest for Israel, how can his children be so vile and corrupt? Well, the same thing happened to Samuel. 
Samuel had sons who didn't honor. Samuel was under Eli's tutelage. So that same transferring of spirit went on to Samuel. His sons didn't honor God. That's why the children of Israel said, we don't want you. Thank you for tuning in to the Be Blessed broadcast. We pray that you are blessed by the message. If you were, please like, share, comment, and definitely subscribe. Or if you would like to order this message in its entirety, please go to our website at www.sbfaithcity.org and there you can sign up to partner with us for the Gathering of the Eagles where you receive all the messages in their entirety for Wednesday and Sunday. I promise you won't be disappointed. But remember, here at Showers of Blessings, we want you to be blessed.